Uh, hey everyone, this is Steve Weintraub with Collider, and I am here with Max Winkler for Jungle Land, the poster right behind you. That's like a, like a fight poster that this guy who I really love designed for it. Um, who, you know, that, that was gonna be on um, the laptop when they, they show the poster for the fight in the movie. So we should be clear, it's not the actual poster no, in the movie. but I like it though. I think it's yeah, really I do cool. too. Yeah, it we it looks looking, cool. We were looking at like old Polish like music festival stuff from like, um, like the 50s and stuff and use that as a reference. So um, I normally don't do anything like generic at the beginning of the interview, but everyone watching this will not have seen your movie yet, right. which just world premiered at the Toronto International yes. Film Festival. So what can you, what have you been telling people about the film? I, that it's, it's sort of like a male melodrama about these two brothers that have sort of existed in this, you know, sort of their own little universe for their whole lives um, that kind of becomes upended when, um, a, a um, they're forced to drive across the country with uh, a girl that they don't really know and um, her existence sort of um, highlights sort of the fissures in their, their own sort of extremely codependent relationship and um, they kind of deal with that. There's a boxing element about the movie too. Yeah, there's definitely some boxing. Yes. Well, just, a, just a touch. Yes, bare knuckle boxing though. Sure. Um, but cause I would never really call the movie sort of like a boxing movie or a fighting movie, but that's definitely um, a tool used in the movie. This is, for people that have seen your previous films, this is a complete departure from what you've done in the past, I think. Yes, me too. And so what was it about this material that said, because sometimes people, you know, do things that like it's hard for people to maybe get the money together, the financing, when you haven't done something like this before. Was it tough for you to get this off the ground? It, well, it was tough in the sense that I had written the original script for this with my two co-writers, Teddy Bressman and David Branson Smith, roughly started 10 years ago when I had gone to my first Toronto with my first movie, Ceremony, which is kind of like a romantic screwball comedy. And, um, you know, to do sort of like a of mice and men male kind of drama like that I wanted to do, people thought it was crazy and people thought I could never do it for the amount of money that I wanted to make it for. And so I sort of waited and, and then Flower, my second movie had kind of come up um, in the middle of that and I made Flower, um, which kind of had nothing to, Flower was like a, a female, um, you know, sort of like, you know, it, it hopes of, 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 you know, like a, like a kitchen sink female drama. So that had nothing to do with my first movie. And then this, all three movies, I think the connection is it's like people really kind of, um, portraying, um, one version of themselves to the outside world where in the inside of their um, lives they're kind of having like a nervous breakdown of identity or something like that. So I, I've, I've found now that I have like sort of a body of work, I have three movies to try to find the, the through line between them, what the, the, what the, the common um, experience is, and I think it was that. What, uh, listen, you, the, the, your two leads who are right up here, yeah. uh, they're incredible in the movie. Oh, yeah, me, I think so too. And so, uh, talk a little bit about landing the two of them because, and was it tough? Like, talk a little bit about how it all came together. Yeah, we, you know, we had gotten, um, Charlie had read the script and responded really strongly to it. He'd really liked the, the movie I'd made previously and written a really nice letter about it. And so we met and Charlie and I connected and the majority of our first conversation was about the anxiety of being a human being and how can your past mistakes, um, you know, not define who you are and can you continue to push forward? I ended up talking a lot about um, Charlie's Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie that I was obsessed with, <laughs> that he had had, you know, people kind of reacted differently to it when it had first come out, but I thought it was an incredibly underrated movie and simultaneously was having a bad insomnia where I wasn't sleeping and I would watch King Arthur every night because it was on and I would send videos to my friends. I was like, this movie's amazing. <laughs> I told a lot of people about it. I even wrote The Lonely Island who are some of my friends, not to name drop, but I said, you guys should write a song about people who love this Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie and feel like no one sees them and that they need a support group for it. And I really into the idea because I thought it was great and Charlie thought it was like, <gasps> taking the piss out of him or making fun of him or something like that. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I think this is like a very important movie. Your performance in it is nuanced and beautiful. I sent the final scene where you fight Jude Law to my therapist and asked if this person who had written this was a client because like it's all about facing your fear and knowing that your fear is actually what defines you and stuff I'd really kind of found um, inherent in the Stanley Kaminsky character that Charlie plays. And um, Jack, 
you know, I'd seen him in 71, I'd seen Jack in Start Up, and I was, I was a massive fan of his, and I knew that he had done a little bit of boxing in his past, um, which I thought was a necessary um, ability um, in order to shoot the fight stuff the way I wanted to shoot it without the budget of teaching somebody how to box and, you know, in a three month period of time. And we, we had dinner, the three of us, and immediately sort of some brother type tendencies had kind of shown themselves just in Charlie's age and um, the difference between them. And, um, you know, their chemistry, their, um, the, the way they come across on screen is, is literally just um, by them being good actors. Like we didn't spend a lot of time at all with the two of them together. We didn't do one of those actor boot camps. We didn't do one of those things where we send them off into Fall River to live for five months and, and drink their own well water. Like it was really just the two of them being authentic on set every day. Sure, it's so interesting. Have you, have you ever had that kind of reaction to a performance like that? Because it's, you know, we're like, because you clearly reacted to King Arthur. It, it clearly yes. had a, a thing that affected you. Yes. Has that happened to you before with another performance? Yes. But in, in more, in different movies, you know, like in five easy pieces, you know what sure. I mean? And in um, The Last Detail or, you know, The Deer Hunter, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, the first time I saw Rushmore, Bottle Rocket. Like, I think Charlie was caught off guard that I was having this type of an authentic experience to King Arthur, which had just lost Warner Brothers a lot of money. And, you know, you know when that happens, people seem to only think about the bottom line and not the actual quality of the movie, which I thought was really, really good. Hey, listen, I, I keep on going on and on. Like, I... There are very few, like everyone talks about making sequels and uh, to, to everything, like everyone right. wants to do a sequel. There are very few movies that I actually would like pay money in advance to get made. I use Master and Commander as one of them. Right. That movie's a masterpiece. I feel the same way. Right. Well, why wouldn't you? Because right. it's a phenomenal I love movie. Peter Weir, yeah. The movie, it, it hurts me every day that I see that film and it doesn't have a sequel. But for me, like that's an example of, you know. You I wanted there to be a sequel of King Arthur? No, I wanted a sequel of Master, Master and Command. Command. Were, wasn't there talks about that briefly? Yeah, the, the problem was the movie cost too much money. Right. So it made money, but it didn't make enough compared to the budget. It's sort of like, remember John Carter? Of course. Okay, so if that movie didn't cost $200 million, they would have made a sequel. Right. But the movie cost a crazy amount of money. It right. wasn't a bomb. It made hundreds of millions of dollars, but not enough to justify a sequel sure. at the cost. Sure. You know I what love, I mean? I love Master and Commander, and I love Peter Weir. I think he's such a diverse, incredible director. I completely agree. The ending of Truman Show is like an intravenous shot of just emotion into my bloodstream when he's talking to Ed Harris and sure that's right oh god it kills me yeah no I mean he again he's what we call a talented filmmaker yeah truly you know a little bit he's, he's done one or two things um so one of the interesting things about this is you filmed this in Massachusetts at which least you're part very, of it. which you're very familiar with I am very familiar but at the Toronto Film Festival at the at the at the world premiere you guys talked about how like the scene would have nobody like you you have a camera at them it's just the two of them and then what you're not seeing is behind the camera there's like a thousand people watching thousands and thousands of people that that could not believe that jacks from sons of anarchy was was in their town um i'd never i'd never really seen a celebrity like this in such a um such a way uh, you know we, we would he would get followed home I mean he really is like sort of a cultural icon because of this show um, especially to American people who have named their children after him and have his face tattooed on them and their dogs are named after him and the craziest thing is he's from the north of England yeah um, but he's it was really gnarly to because we weren't prepared we didn't have like the security detail and stuff and eventually we had to have like decoy cars drive you know um, outside um, the house when, when Charlie was leaving so people couldn't follow him home, um, which was shocking and made it really hard to shoot because I'd never been used to, I was, I've always been sort of like, you know, grab the camera with my DP, let, we were set to shoot over there, let's go shoot over there, but we really couldn't because we were getting followed everywhere. And the first day of shooting, we used our camera test day as a way to shoot the opening titles of the movie, which is um, one of my favorite parts of the movie. And um, I thought it was gonna be this really easy thing. And then all of a sudden one kid on a bike says, yo, there's Jax. And the second kid on the bike calls somebody. And then within minutes, there's thousands and thousands of people out there waiting for Charlie. Um, and uh, it was really a, a, quite a 
sensation. Yeah, yeah. it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. But also, Massachusetts, you don't get like huge movie stars or huge stars. Um, you know, in Fall River. No, definitely not. I mean, I, there'd never been a movie shot in Fall River. We were shooting in Fall River, New Bedford, Taunton, Raynham. And these places, you know, were, you know, at, at, at a point in the world, you know, the wealthiest cities in the entire world based on textiles, based on whaling, and have since fallen into sort of depressive times as far as the workforce goes. Um, and... Um, I, I loved shooting there. I loved the people there. We turned, you know, an old, you know, sort of broken down Greyhound dog racing track basically like into our, you know, budget Pinewood. Like we had, you know, we turned it, we, we set, you know, our stages up there. We did holding there. We shot, you know, 15 different locations for across the country in this Greyhound track. Um, and it was bizarre. I mean, the energy is weird but yeah did, did it help you look people are always challenged to try to find extras yes. especially, and you have some boxing scenes did it help having them without a doubt yeah we had great extras we had this guy named um billy uh who did our i forgot his last name billy what's your last name billy dowd an incredible local casting director and he found us unbelievable background actors and everyone had an interesting face and and it, it, you know all of our you know actors who only have two lines were incredible. I, I loved the whole experience of being there. There's a great Portuguese market there we would always eat at called Portugalia. I'm, I'm always I remember the food on when I get to visit movie sets. Yes, it's the only thing I remember. It's, it's black out from everything else. Right. Um. I, I, I'm, I love talking about the editing room because ultimately that's the final rewrite. So you get in the editing room with all your footage. How did what excited you and what made you nervous? The performances excited me. I knew leaving there that at the very least the actors would be fine and if anybody became blackballed it would be me. Um, I knew the actors were great. Um, what I was concerned about was I didn't know if I, I'd never directed fighting before and um, I, I really didn't think I was gonna be able to do it. Like I, you know, we had a plan and we watched Raging Bull and we watched Ali and we watched Rust and Bone and my DP and my editor and I were, were versed on what we went for and how we wanted to create each fight scene as something else. And um, I was really nervous that we weren't going to be able to make it work because we just didn't have the time. I mean, Jungle Land, we shot in one, the final fight, we shot in one and a half days, and the rest of them we shot half days or, or a day. And for people that don't realize who are watching this, that's just not a lot of time. No, it's not a lot of time. And, and actually the fights have ended up working out. I, I was really happy with it. And I thought because we didn't have stunt people and you know, I was really proud of, of being able to be on Jack's face for that, that whole time and really getting to see how incredibly physical he is as an actor, um, which I'd seen again in startup, you know, and you know, as, as a perfect example. And, um, yeah. Uh, one of the things that, and again, I want to go back to the the world premiere. Charlie got very emotional yeah. talking about how 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 he felt you captured a really honest portrayal. Like he was really just honest on the screen, and he really almost was getting choked up. I mean, uh, and he's worked with a lot of people. What does it mean for you when you know your lead like that or your co-lead has that kind of reaction? It, it meant a lot to me. I got choked up too, hearing how proud he was of himself because he's so hard on himself. And, and the only work I had to do with him as an actor on set was to tell him just to go easier on himself because he, um, he, he's a perfectionist. And you know he gets, he gets um, cast in these leading man roles a lot. And what I love of him in this movie is, is he really is a subtle, really gentle, actor when he can play sort of like the Razzo Rizzo part instead of the um, King Arthur part. Sure. And um, he was, you know, we cut his hairline back and he lost so much weight and he was so, he was so um, sensitive to, to his other actors and to the filmmaking part of it. I, I just, his performance is one of the things in my, you know, short career that I'm, I'm the most proud of. Um, yeah. I was going to say that the other thing about this is you're making a road movie with not a lot of days, not a lot of money. You're making a boxing movie, not a lot of days, not a lot of money. And uh, so did you just say, I just want to make the most challenging thing I can? I'm an idiot. Like, I never make it easy on myself. Flower we shot for $500,000, and, and that was, you know, the scope of that was, you know, quixotic. I always want to say quixotic, but it's quixotic, I think. Um, 
I, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, I, 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 I wanted to make a road movie without cutting away to, I knew this just creatively before we even got into budget cutting. I wanted to make a road movie where you don't cut to a wide shot of the Grand Canyon and see the car driving by. Like, I, I felt like we could show scope somewhere in a different way. And, um, yeah, it was, it was ambitious. But the good news about that part of the world, you know, we shot, we shot in Reno, we shot in San Francisco, but the majority of our time was in New England. And, and there's such beautiful locations there. I mean, yep. it made it really easy on our production designer because the, the locations are the sets. I mean, they were perfect. And it helped everyone get into the mood creatively. And yeah. Uh, Scott Free Productions yeah. were, they, I guess they helped produce. Yes, they produced it. Ridley and Kevin and Ryan and Stoll and uh, Kevin Walsh, Ryan Stoll and Jules Daly. Uh, how did you connect with them? Uh, because it's a big company to have on your movie. Yeah, they were amazing. Um, Jules Daly, who had run RSA for years, which is um, the Ridley Scott agency. It's the, um, the uh, commercial arm of their company. And um, she signed me uh, for commercials off of Flower. And, um, you know, we had been talking and I sort of loosely pitched this to her and she said, you know, maybe I'll read it. And I sent the script to her and within, you know, this script had been around for 10 years. Various people were telling me why it's impossible to make. And Jules Daly was the one who said, no, I know how to make this and brought it into Scott Free. And that's when Kevin and Ridley and Ryan got involved and, and the movie got off the ground really, really quickly. And everyone, everyone in there, I mean, Ridley Scott's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. I actually had ironically, my dad came to visit me in the editing room and he had reminded me that early on in high school, I was obsessed with one of Ridley Scott's movies called White Squall, which is like a super random Ridley right? Scott movie. And I have like all these signed headshots from like the cast from White Squall and like signed soundtracks and signed scripts and I'd forgotten about that and, and Ridley was in the office that day and the three of us were laughing about how bizarre the world is that we were all there together. Uh, it's interesting. You definitely, it sounds like you get obsessed about something, go all in, yes. and then until the next obsession hits. Yes. It's all started with White Squall. Um, yeah. West Side Story was very early on for me. It was probably my first obsession. I really liked that. And it since uh, has found its way to King Arthur. Guy Ritchie's King Arthur. Uh, I'm sure there's been other things that, uh, what do you think about Spielberg redoing West Side Story? I think it'll probably be great. I heard he's okay too. Yeah, he's been, he's got quite a track record. <laughs> um, I, I think it'll be great and different. And I think there's parts of the, f I, I think West Side Story, you know, between, you know, Robert Wise and Jerome Robbins, I think it's a, probably a perfect movie, but I think there's probably things that you could do differently just to see what that sort of experience was like, you know, potentially casting actual Latin American people as the Puerto Ricans would probably be the smart thing first instead of Greek people. Um, but George Chikiris is great, obviously. Um, and I think it'll probably be great. Yeah, I, I, I am, I'm actually really looking forward to it. And I think that, you know, if any, listen, I, you're playing with a third rail with a movie like that, but, uh, but I, if anyone can do it, it's him. Yeah, and it's just great to take risks and try shit and just mess around and, and oh. you never know what can happen. He's such, there's no one in the history of the world that's ever moved the camera like him. Um, even close, I don't think. And I, I feel like he's going to shoot the dancing, and they got that great um, choreographer. Um, I, I forgot his name. I think it's Justin Peck. Maybe it's something else, but he's an amazing choreographer, and he did Carousel, and he did, um, you know, all these beautiful ballets, if this is the person I'm thinking of, and I think they're probably just going to do an incredible job. Well, the other thing is anyone who landed that gig you obviously grew up with the movie right. and everyone it's not one of those movies where people truthfully are doing it for a paycheck right. i think it's if you're doing that movie you genuinely want it to be great yes you do jungle land for the paycheck you do west side story <laughs> with Steven spielberg for the passion and love of it right um so i want to go back to the editing room yes sir what was the last scene that you took out of the film before locking your cut and why the last scene i took out of the movie there's a scene of them checking into Jungle Land, and there's like this sort of like Vietnam veteran sort of guy who was like very early on in casting that I was obsessed with, named Ken Cheeseman. I'm gonna name check him here because he did not get cut out of the movie because of his performance. He got cut out of the movie because I was so into his performance and I had gone so crazy by the end of shooting this that I gave him like a really big part. So like after the insanity that is this movie and they're finally checking into Jungle Land, we get into sort of like a Hamlet style monologue with the man who's checking them in, asking them if they're ready for the fight. And um, P. 
people were left with some questions is why we were focusing on a man who's in the script named his old senior played by the brilliant Ken Cheeseman in a tie-dye jungle land shirt that David Branson Smith, our writer, designed and why we were focusing on this moment when it, everything that came before was crazy and what's going to ha happen after is pretty crazy. So Ken got the ax and uh, his performance was excellent. Even on set, I knew I was getting indulgent and crazy by focusing on this character, but I, I felt like I deserved it after everything that we had been through. What is it like no, when you realize, okay, this is gonna be getting cut out, what is it like, do you pick up the phone and call people when, they, when they're losing the thing? Or are you sort of like, is that the dread, like are you sending an email? Like what do you do? Because it must be an agonizing thing. I. For this one, I, I took I took this uh, I took this collider interview to tell Ken Cheeseman this. For others, you know, there's there's it's always hard, but it so rarely has to do with the actor. You know, if I've done my job correctly and I've cast the right people, and I did in this, there, I, I have I love everyone from Jonathan Majors to John Cullum to Jessica Barden. I love them all, and sometimes, you know, when the movie becomes this sort of organism, it just doesn't work as well because of faults of my own. A section of the movie that kind of became different structurally was the first act because we'd focus so much on their backstory. We were getting feedback from audiences saying, we get their backstory by the way these two guys interact with each other, you don't need to over explain it. So I lost one of my favorite scenes of the movie which was Jonathan Majors sort of um, playing Pepper breaking down to Charlie and Jack, their history together. and. The scene was brilliantly acted by Jonathan Majors. It was in one of my favorite locations, which was in this old sort of Wamasada club in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And there were these giant squids on the wall. It was amazing, but it didn't work because at that point in the movie, everyone's just waiting for these guys to get on the road and you're stopping and engaging in monologues, which is just my fault with the writing and my fault with the staging. And um, it leave, people just wanna go. So, you know, I, I I, it's always it's always hard, and I think the best thing, the menchiest thing you can do is just write them and say, just so you know, this has nothing to do with you, this is my own fault. And I wrote Jonathan Major said we had to lose that of one of my favorite scenes because it it and because of what I just told you. Sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, um, I, it's just I've, I've spoken to a lot of directors, and they always talk about uh, some people find out they lost their parts uh, at the premiere because they just don't have the heart to tell them. You know, it's just it's so interesting to. That yeah. feels that feels not right to me. I I, I agree, but you yeah, know. I know I know someone who had the, who had that happen to them, and and I, I I'm gonna try to be better than that. Yeah, uh, one of the things that the film deals with is the American dream, yes. but from the like it, it it focuses on people that sometimes don't get focused on. Yeah, people really like these two are on the the you know they are struggling. Right. You know, um, and sort of talk about that aspect of the film. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this idea of like the American dream, does everyone get a piece of it or is everyone entitled to it? You know, you have these like old sort of books that were circulating in like 1900 to get factory workers to feel good about themselves, like the Horatio Alger books. And like, I feel like, you know, Charlie's character, you know, got a little too high off of them and, and thinks that he's sort of entitled to this thing without any talent and without any skill whatsoever except the, his adjacency to Jack's character who's the only one in the film that really has this gift and with that gift comes guilt of do I am I do I deserve this do I want this um, and and I really tried to um, to to portray that sort of blind optimism of Charlie's as as truthful honestly as as we could and i think charlie's performance obviously does the heavy lifting of that and makes it really good um you know but you were, were you kind of meet all of these people who have their own version of the dream pepper has his version of the dream he's kind of living it um jessica's character sky you know sort of talks about how she wants this one part of the dream how she always wanted to be something and it didn't quite work out and has found herself in a totally different situation charlie has this dream that he and his brother are going to live in california and have a house and his brother's going to be a professional fighter and they're going to have a sponsorship and clothing line and all of this stuff and we kind of know charlie's almost like you know, it's almost kind of like Mama Rose and Gypsy. We always saw him more as a single mother than a than an older brother. You know, really maternal like energy, really tactile, really, um, really everything he does is to try and get this 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 person, this other person, in the best position possible to succeed. And by the and you know, 
it's um it comes at a cost obviously because you you want to figure out you know you have this sort of thing with you know in movies and in life with parents you how much is your dream and how much is it that you want this other person to live out their dream well one of the things i liked about and again you know almost everyone watching this will not have seen the movie but and so i don't want to do any sort of uh, spoilers, but one of the things I really liked about Charlie's character in it is that he sort of acknowledges that that he is not the most gifted person. Yeah. The, he like sort of just figured out his place, mm -hmm. and I, I liked that because oftentimes in movies, everyone, you know, it's unrealistic. They think that right. they are the the a you, you know um they're they're the a storyline, right. but he sort of knows. You know, I'm the B storyline. Right. You know? Yeah, I love that moment when he has that that he has that conversation with Jessica's character, Sky, and he sort of says, like, I haven't really done anything. I'm not planning on it either, because I, I don't have it. Like all I know is that this guy's got something special and I'll do everything in my power to protect it and make sure that he uses it to the best of his ability. And um Yeah. I, I thought that was, I thought, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I thought that, I love that scene, the way they acted that scene. Yeah, it's like a, it's a, it's a, a really realistic moment and someone who understands their place. Right. Not like it can't change. Right. But, you know. Um, right. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, so who, random question, uh, who ruined the most takes and why? Who ruined the most takes? Or who flubbed the most takes and why? It's crazy. We we were really lucky on on the actor front. I mean, I probably ruined the most takes just by either. I you know what? I was really. I'm trying to think. All these actors were so are so prepared. There's really not a lot of flubbing that went on on this set. And I've I've been on a lot of sets where I've ruined takes by laughing, and I, I felt really guilty about it. Um, but I, I, no one on this set. It was a really focused set. Um, cool. It was really, um, we didn't have a lot of time. We had a lot of scenes and we had a lot of different locations. And so we were really quick and diligent. I would say the most frustrating people on set were me and Damian Garcia, the cinematographer, because we were really indecisive when we would get on set. We had a plan of what we wanted and then often find that our plan was not um, what we thought it was going to be. Especially with a thousand people watching. Yes. And so we would change our minds often. We would we would start to shoot. Um, we would get ready to make a shot, and then Damian would start to do that sort of baseline soundtrack sound from uh, from Seinfeld. Whenever you'd see an establishing shot, like bow, and we were just like, we should re we should redo this shot. It looks like it's a sitcom establishing shot. Um, so I would say it was probably Damian and I that were the most uh, time. time sure. Wasting. What TV show would you love to guest write and direct? The is. The New Sopranos, a show or a movie? It is a prequel movie. Right. If they decided to do a television show based on that, I, I, I think about The Sopranos probably every day. I think about The Sopranos and The Beatles probably every day. So we found the other two obsessions. Right. There's so many more. <laughs> I went through the same thing with The Wire. Um, I think about The Sopranos every day. I think that, as far as character studies go, is probably the most incredible exploration of a really, really complicated human being. And also that show did it before, that was one of the shows that ushered in the golden age of television. Yeah. It was ahead of the curve in terms of what it was doing. Yeah, I would say that in the Larry Sanders show, if they ever if they ever redid that somehow without Gary, we're probably, or, and, or The Sopranos without Gandalfine. I wouldn't recommend it because those guys are the heartbeat of the shows, but, um, I, those are my favorite shows. I'm not. I'm not so caught up on. I love the show Jess is on. Um, the end of the fucking world. Oh, um, I still haven't seen that. Oh, you'll you would love it. it was, I've heard everyone raves. And but that actually, because I know we were talking about how it's hard to watch TV. That actually, you can finish in a day. Like you can really burn through that. Sure. I mean, the 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 toughest part, and I'm sure you hear it too, is uh, you're constantly being told you should watch that show. Right. It's just like it's crazy. What, what show are you being told to watch the most? That you uh, haven't yet. I'm halfway through Fleabag. That's incredible too. Right. Everyone raved. Uh, I'm trying, man. Have you started the second season no. of Fleabag? I finished the first recently. The second season will really make it all click too. That will be the Madeline cookie where you're like, oh, right, this is an actual. Everyone says the second season's even better. Yeah, that and yeah. I also really want to direct like a period drama, like a BBC period drama. Okay. So that I think is probably the best answer to your question because those shows really get made every year. And like I would do like, you know, like a Howard's End or like a Pride and Prejudice or like some sort of a Jane Austen thing. Do you think Kubrick's Napoleon ever gets made? 
Um, I don't know. Well, I know Kubrick's Napoleon doesn't get made, but, but no, but because yes. he did all that prep work, he has a script. The script exists. He has all that stuff, and I wonder now in this day and age, with all these streaming channels and all these people looking for content, if someone would have the balls to say, "Let's do it." I'm sure someone will. Um, just something I to just think heard about. yesterday that they want to remake the Princess Bride. Yeah, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. I can't. Um, I'm not down with that. I'm not. Um, I don't know if. And by, and by the way, I'm down with remakes. Me too. I think you can do it. I think there's good versions of remakes. Sure. 100%. The Princess Bride is one of my all-time favorite films, and I'm not down with it. Me neither. Like, I'm just not. And that one, like, that idea needs to know. I just, I just can't. Like, the it's, only interesting version of that is if it's, if it's told, if, if, if Wallace Shawn is tucking in his sick, oh no, Wallace Shawn is dead in the movie. But I'm interested in Wallace Shawn playing the Peter uh, Falk character. And whoever Wallace Shawn's grandson in is, is playing the Fred Savage character. Okay, that's a twist that I had not thought about, but it's just and such a perfect movie. I know. It's a 10 out of 10. Yeah, it's really, really so, good. I used to watch it whenever I was sick at home. Yeah, every, On VHS, ev I'm sure everyone had that everyone, experience. Which leads me to my next question. What movie have you seen the most? <laughs> what movie have I seen the most? Probably E.T. or... There will be blood. <laughs> or the a, deer hunter. <laughs> right, that is the, not the two movies that I thought you would say uh, that went together. Et, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. There will be blood. Wasn't expecting Rushmore it. problem. You know, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Sure. Hook. I saw like multiple, multiple, multiple times in the theater at the City Walk. I remember as a kid. I, I would, call it the Shitty Walk. Yeah. Oh my God, I haven't been there in a while. Yeah, and there's a good reason not to go. Um, unless I just had to have my birthday at the Bubba Gump there. Um. <laughs> um, but yeah, I saw Hook there multiple times, and I, I just um, I, I could, just want to see you having a birthday party at the Bubba Gumba Shrimp. I think Company. I'll probably do it next year if right. everything goes according to plan. <laughs> I, uh, if I what, decide to just blow it all up. Right. What What's funny is, like at this moment, if you did a, a birthday party there, it could actually be cool. Because I think it's I'll so, do it. Probably. <laughs> it's so different. You think I could get them to sponsor it? Uh, Bubba Gump? Yeah. If you bring Charlie, yes. Right. Well, you can get anyone to sponsor anything if you bring Charlie. That's, I think that's the, out. that's the secret. Um, I am curious. Uh, I absolutely love Barry. Just yes, love. me too. Can you watch that show and like see, is that weird for you to watch? No, it's weird for me to watch like Happy Days. It's not weird for me to watch Barry. Yeah, Happy Days I could see like. Watching Barry is, 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 is to me, and I've always felt this way. I felt like my dad, as, as wonderful as his career was, was like this unbelievable, um, underused kind of treasure. And I felt like whoever got to him first would reap the rewards, whether it was Wes Anderson, P.T. Anderson, the Coen brothers, Spike Jones, like whoever had the brilliance to cast him in something weird and off brand and not as sort of like the avuncular Jewish guy, I think would, would be looked at as a genius. And I think Bill Hader was the one who got there. And, um, I think it's just like brilliant off casting, and and I think my dad is so good in it um, because of the scripts and because of how well it's directed, and and it's not weird for me because I'm kind of just like this is what I was saying, you know what I mean? For all sure. those years, I'm just to say like I think it's one of the best shows on TV. Me too, it's, I love it. And season two is unbelievable. Me too. Like and Bill's such a great director. I think I completely agree. There's a few episodes in season two that are like jaw dropping. Yeah, and there's some monologues Incredible. in season two that I'm like, are you? Jo I mean, this is unbelievable. Yeah, they're geniuses. I went to high school and college with Hiro Murai, so it's amazing to watch him and my dad work together. Yeah, I, I have not. I mean, if you're not watching Barry, I strongly recommend watching. Yeah, he's amazing in it, and and I love watching it because I I feel like he's living his full potential as an actor now at seventy whatever he is. I don't know how old he is exactly, but in the seventies. Yeah, I mean, first of all, props. Second of all, um, oh, so my my one of my last things. So obviously, this premiered at TIFF. Yes. For people that want to see it, do yes. you think there'll be some sort of news at some point about- I'm hoping for today. When does this get released? This will be online in the coming days, within yeah. six days. We have we have really nice um, offers and I feel really lucky about that because everyone's talking about how scary it is to make movies like this and how hard it is to release them. And I'm hoping we'll, we'll have it all wrapped up by the time this comes out and um, it'll be out this year. What do you know what you're going to do next? 
there, I'm messing around with a with a couple of things. There's this there's this movie that I didn't write um, that I, w- I was thinking about making with Will Ferrell um, about this guy who um, embezzles a bunch of money from the Collins Street Fruitcake Factory. It's based on a real story and it's a really insane um, story and. Um, I really wanted to work with him for a long time. I, I love Will. Me too, and it's a really dramatic part for him. I think he'll be amazing in it. And um, a couple of a couple of other things. I wrote um, a western with with my frequent kind of collaborator, this great writer and director named Matt Spicer, that I want to make very much, um, called Heart of Stone. So that might be another one like Jungle Land that takes ten years to make because there's not a lot of people throwing their hands in the air to make a to pay for a western. Um, but yeah, those are the two movies that I, I'm the most excited about right now. Cool. Listen, I wish you nothing but the best. I feel the same way about you. Con- <laughs> Congrats on this. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully uh, it will be coming out soon yes. and we can sit at the arc light and do this again. I can't wait. Cool. On that note, a Jungle Land will, at some point, you'll be able to see it. And until then, watch Barry.